If you're subscribed to my YouTube channel, you will know that my number one specialty is making videos defending movies and shows. People generally hate it. I don't know why or how it started, but I've always loved defending the underdog. And the underdog of today is Sucker Punch. First of all, Sucker Punch is so good. Directed by the legendary Zack Snyder, many haven't heard of it or don't remember it. And that's because the movie was generally rejected by audiences and endlessly butchered by movie reviewers. And while the movie had some issues that we'll definitely talk about. It's somewhat unfair considering shittier movies were criticized much less. You can say what you will about this movie, but Sucker Punch is not a bad movie. Similar to movies such as Tron, it was simply ahead of its time. Many of the reviewers completely disregarded the groundbreaking visual effects of this movie, and I believe this movie definitely paved the way for future innovative VFX. To put this in perspective, this was released in 2011 guys, but this Despite everything, this movie was accepted by the few who've seen it because they could see that there was something special about this movie. I wouldn't really call it a flawless masterpiece, but it's a really unique and brave concept to try to achieve. I don't think you understand how much I love this movie, and I believe if this movie came out nowadays, it would definitely have a better perception. So let's see what this is all about. Sucker Punch is set sometime in the 1960s. The story revolves around a girl who's only known by the nickname Baby Doll. Baby Baby Doll's mother dies at the beginning of the film and is left with her abusive stepfather and younger sister. During an attempt to fight back, Baby Doll tries to kill him but accidentally shoots her younger sister. The stepfather frames her for the murder and he brings her into a mental institution where a corrupt orderly is taking bribes to have patients lobotomized to get them out of the way for rich family members. Just so Baby Doll's stepfather can inherit her late mother's money once the two girls are out of the picture. All of this plays out in the first 10 minutes. Sucker Punch doesn't spend much time on dialogue, and the opening in particular leans heavily on visual clues, relying on viewers to piece things together. It also establishes the dreamlike, dark fairy tale vibe in every frame that follows. The whole movie focuses on the sad story of a girl that tries to escape her sad reality by creating other realities. The main character has gone through a series of major traumas. Her mother is dead her sister is dead, and now she's being institutionalized against her will. So, as a reaction, she creates these fantasies. The first level is in a cabaret slash brothel, and in the second level she is a trained assassin. In the end, you realize that she is truly in an institution. Five days from being lobotomized because it's the 60s. The description of the movie is pretty clear. There are multiple levels to her coping that are clearly indicated by a switch in music and palette. The movie gives viewers there is plenty of indication when we're moving between levels of fantasy here. From the beginning, Sucker Punch destroys the space between reality and fantasy. As the tagline says, reality is a prison, your mind can set you free. Very little of the two hour running time plays out in the real world. Shortly after she's committed, Baby Doll concocts an elaborate fantasy in which the asylum becomes a cabaret theater slash brothel. She and her fellow inmates are the dancers. The doctor who treats them all, Dr. Gorski, is their instructor slash madame and Blue is the evil boss keeping them all under lock and key. That setting soon gives way to another layer of fantasy. Every time Baby Doll dances, she closes her eyes and is taken to a new fantastical landscape. We in the audience never actually see her dance. Those musical moments are realized instead as CGI action sequences that unfold in these dreams within a dream. And here we come into this aspect of Sucker Punch. Whether he meant it or not, Zack Snyder created what looks to be some type of a cinematic version of a video game. Baby Doll's dance sequences take their form and structure from games to an extent that I've never seen in any other movie. I love the action sequences simply because I like ridiculous kung fu fights and giant samurai demons. I think they look incredible, and the mashups of styles, ideas, and villains in them is both terrifying and impressive. It makes sense to me that the bad guys in any given version of Baby Doll's fantasies are inhuman 
monsters because the men who are abusing her in real life are also inhuman monsters. The fact that the imagery is clashing and strange makes some sense too. This is dissociation after all. Many abuse survivors have that one self-defense mechanism that help them make it through the trauma, which is to go somewhere else, to let their emotional and mental self be somewhere distant, especially if that emotional place is one in which the survivor is in complete control. The reason baby doll is never in realistic danger during her slips into her fantasy world is because she's creating the entire universe to make herself feel safe. The only time that fantasy gets broken is when something goes wrong in the real world and shatters baby doll's ability to dissociate for a moment. Fundamentally, Sucker Punch is a story about escape from our demons and a past that haunts us from real physical threats from the ceaseless noise of an active yet fractured mind. Most importantly, from a society that shuns one group or another as less than equal. Baby Doll, clearly a victim, is robbed of any power she had right at the start. Sucker Punch isn't a story of her self-empowerment or of these women casting off their shackles. It's about how they craft for themselves this illusion of freedom, an elusive thing that's always just out of reach and dependent on one more win. As we learn in the end, the only real victory hinges on a great loss. When Baby Doll dances, the world around her disappears. That's where she sees things as they are, not the truth of her reality, mind you. I'm talking about inner truth, the ideas and impulses that will eventually lead her to freedom. And speaking of freedom, much of the plot revolves around Baby Doll and her friends, engineering a very real escape plan. They all want their freedom. We see that plan hatched, not in the real world, but in that action-packed sub-fantasy, the map, fire, knife, and key, the focus of this escape quest, all have connections in both the real world and the brothel fantasy layered on top of it. The brothel itself is a form of escape. We're meant to understand that it's the defense mechanism Baby Doll's subconscious conjures up to help her cope with her current circumstance and the series of horrible events that led her there. An opportunity to step away from the world for a period of time and inhabit another being, another mindset, and another reality. That's what makes them so special and unique as a form of entertainment. Of course, they're not actually games and Sucker Punch, but in using the language of video games to power these sequences, Snyder helps us contextualize Baby Doll's purest coping mechanism and better understand how it ties into the movie's broader, darker themes. Baby Doll and her friends are chasing freedom, which they all see as a happy ending, but the truth is not so quite clear-cut. These women have been robbed of control over their own lives by the abusive men of the world. Freedom for them, we're told, is a total removal from that grim reality. If you want a good indication of what dissociation looks like, of what one coping mechanism for surviving trauma has been, we can definitely point to Sucker Punch as one of our few examples of major media products that give it a fair treatment. Sucker Punch has a lot to say about the objectification and othering of women in both pop culture and IRL culture. The movie is meant to be an examination of sexism and the multiple planes on which it exists, as it is shown in the relationship between the real world that Baby Doll is experiencing and the first level of her fantasy in order to survive in this hellhole of an institution where she is being repeatedly abused, with possibly some essay happening as well, when she's already been traumatized by the events that led her to the situation in the first place. She chooses to create a fantasy world for herself that is easier to deal with. It's Baby Doll's necessary emotional escape from the day-to-day -day existence in the institution. And it's not surprising, based on her situation in real life, that this world is hypersexualized. She is getting a huge amount of unwanted attention from men in the real world. Her fantasy world helps her cope with reality, but it does reflect it to some degree as well. She's still a prisoner there. She's still exploring exploited and objectified sexually there. Her life is still about the central point of imprisonment. Over time in the real world, it becomes clear to Baby Doll that either because of her looks or because of the personalities of the orderlies, that she is noticed more than the other patients at the hospital. She also learns that she can manipulate the orderlies to her objectifying herself. She recognizes that her fellow inmates can get away with stealing things, sneaking around, and successfully attempting to escape if the guards' attentions are 
focusing on baby doll. This is where the second level of fantasy comes into play. In her mid-level fantasy, she views this as dancing, the sexualized act that will entrance the men who run her world. It's too hard for her brain though to face the idea that sexualizing herself in the real world is a form of fighting back against her abusers. And so she creates another level of fantasy where she is completely in control as a violent commando, still sexualized because again in real life she's abused. The fact that the fight scene escapism is shown in full fanboy fantasy, wearing tight and super revealing clothing is done completely on purpose. The escapes, whether she's thinking about fighting zombies or samurais, are purposely presented as a guilty pleasure for the audience. We are being distracted, just as the orderlies in the institution are being distracted. Saying all of this, I'm also not so sure that I think this film is empowering at all. I think the movie has more levels than a lot of viewers thought upon first glance, but I don't think this is supposed to be any sort of uplifting story about the power of women. I think it's actually about how bad the situation is for them, and how the mechanisms for fighting back against that system, at least in the context of the institution, are basically limited to death or lobotomy. The movie doesn't spend enough time giving a voice to the women it claims to speak for. We see plenty of skin from the five stars, but very little of who they are. I think this movie doesn't try to sugarcoat things. They spend the film fighting against men physically and mentally, so the point is clear. These ladies can't win, even in their imaginations, whether in a mental hospital, in a brothel, or on a futuristic battlefield. They are up against immeasurable odds. The fact that Baby Doll spends the entire film facing the prospect of a lobotomy is a heavy but clear metaphor. The heat can be justified mostly because of the last 20 minutes of Sucker Punch's theatrical cut, which I'll admit was a huge mess, largely because it's missing a key scene between Baby Doll and the High Roller, aka the surgeon performing her lobotomy. However, if you watch the extended cut, it corrects these plot holes, putting a much better conclusion to Baby Doll's story. Also, one of the major criticisms of the film from reviewers is that Emily Browning plays Baby Doll as a blank slate. She doesn't seem to emote much or show reactions to the outside world, but that's mostly because Browning performs a character who is in massive shock and who is quickly learning how to survive in an environment where she basically can't. It was actually compelling, and to agree with the haters, the story Snyder is trying to tell does fall apart in a few ways. The dialogue light approach makes way for Snyder's powerful special effects, but it comes at the cost of character development. Baby Doll is the most developed character of the bunch, but the rest of her squad even Sweet Pea and her sister Rocket are somewhat underdeveloped. And speaking of Sweet Pea, there's this interesting theory I saw online that apparently this is all coming from Sweet Pea's imagination. That would explain why besides Baby Doll, she's the only character that gets as much spotlight. And it would also explain why she was the only one who got to escape and not Baby Doll. Also, the monologue in the beginning talks about how everyone has an angel. Maybe Baby Doll is that angel, and she is some type of an alter ego that's Sweet Pea created to escape. I mean, they do share some similarities in their characters. We also see the same little sister older sister dynamic between Sweet Pea and Rocket versus Baby Doll and her sister. They're both protectors of their little sisters. I'm not sure about it all, but it's definitely a fun little theory. All in all, Sucker Punch is a fun thrill ride. I appreciate ambition in film, even if it's executed somewhat incorrectly. I love the fact that someone had the courage to make something so grand. I was really interested in seeing it for the meta narratives and themes of dissociative realities and trauma. I also really like movies where there are a lot of things played out metaphorically, and can be read both on surface levels and deeper levels, such as Kubrick movies that have their surface level stories which are interesting and weird, but you get this little feeling that there is something more to this. You get an uncanny sensation that makes you want to explore it further and watch it again. One of the strongest parts of the movie may very well be the soundtrack. The dramatic opening sequence in which Baby Doll's stepfather attacks her is perfect while a cover by Sweet Dreams by Eurythmics is sung by the lead actress. Few songs have ever matched the mood of a scene so well. Sucker Punch has these rare moments where a perfectly chosen song encapsulates the feeling and action of a moment, where visual elements collide with the auditory. Zack Snyder created something much smarter in Sucker Punch than he ever gets credit for. It's deeply flawed in a few important ways, but pay 
attention and it will take you by surprise. It was sold as a vehicle for dazzling CG effects and sexy women kicking ass. But there's a thoughtfulness to the way Sucker Punch is constructed that makes it so worthwhile.